Welcome to episode nine of Civil War Breakfast Club. I am your co-host, Mary, and joining me is the awesome Darren Weeks. Wow, awesome. You know, I knew if when I gave you those pub publicity the last couple of times I get the intro, I, I knew I'd get some payback for this. I'll take yeah. awesome. But the, compared to the other words you call me, we'll take that. A lot of those <laughs> other words start with A as well, but that's another story. Actually, so they start with F. Fuckers. That's right. Yep, there goes. That, all right, well, there you go. Yeah, 13 I seconds. You have to write here. <laughs> and once again, the capital E is next to this broadcast <laughs> on iTunes. So, anyway, how are you, Mary? How are you today? I noticed your hair looks so different today. Yes, yeah. For those that aren't like, or who are listening, I have my hair pulled back in a ponytail tonight, and I usually just wear it down. So, thank you for noticing. <laughs> hey, it's, <laughs> it's so different. But anyway, yeah. So, um, How's, how's your week been? How's everything going? You have a good weekend? I did, thank you. Yes, it was good. We had a great live on Saturday. Oh, we did, certainly. So, yeah, that was pretty awesome. Saw a yeah. bit of Boston on Sunday. Yeah, a little bit of, little bit of the city on Sunday. Going to yes. see my, uh, my, my home city. They'll have some, some, some time in. I can't talk yep. today. Wow. <laughs> Spent some time in the city and got to have a good time with that. And that was fun, yep. certainly. And, and, uh, but yeah, to your point, the live was great. Well, mm-hmm. everybody who signed on to that gets an A for the day because that was, that was a lot of – Yeah, a lot, a lot of – um, people jumping onto it and having a good time with it. And we have fun because people are really into it and they, yep. you know, and that, you know, reminds me right at the beginning of our upcoming civil war breakfast club round table, yep. which is going to be, well, this is going to drop on Saturday morning. Yeah. So it'll, so it'll be like the following Wednesday and we'll yep, get those that, that, that information out. So, so you can send your emails to civil war breakfast club at Gmail. Yeah. Dot com. Dot com? Okay. Yeah. And so if you're interested, we'll do it. And um, and the lovely Queen of the North will email you a copy of the Zoom link and yeah. you can be participate. We'll talk about that, but that'll be pretty cool. And that's um that's a conversation for another day. And so um I thought overall we put Chickamauga and I put a nice little bow on it last week. Yeah, I thought we did. it seemed like it did pretty strong. Yep. Uh, I'm much more learned now. And uh, you certainly got to talk about Chickamauga, oh. which is cool. Well, you rocked it. And um well, how was your wow. weekend? Well, you know, it was one of those things, you know, just one of those things. Got to hang out a little bit, had some fun. Yep. A um, lot of long weekend here. And we had a little, we had, um, th- oh, by the way, that reminds me, happy Thanksgiving belated. Oh, well, thank you. To happy our friends thing. up, yes. to our friends up there across the border. We had a holiday here. We had Columbus Day here, yep. I believe they still call it. And so we had Monday off and um, it was nice to have a long, a long weekend, but mm-hmm. now it's back to the grind again. Now it's time to get back to the podcast, get back to work. Yep. And get ready for um for another exciting exciting topic. Yeah. Hey, and- I was going to tell you. Did you know? I don't know if you knew this, but did you know that George McClellan didn't get along with Lincoln? I'm shocked. I, I shocked. A lot of people. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't. <laughs> so speaking of George McClellan, what beer are you drinking? Tonight? Oh my God! Good catch tonight. I am drinking from Antietam Brewery, Little Mac IPA. One million IBUs. And it's slow going. And since it is the uh, Antietam Brewery, I'm drinking out of the Antietam coffee mug. So that's my libation for the evening. And I think this is a good one. It's a good solid IPA. Um, and uh, pretty soft. If you've been to Antietam Brewery, anybody out there, definitely go. It's a cool little place to go. And uh, last time we went there, they had no power, which sucked. But the time before that, I went to buy some beer. And this is my last one. Oh, so you saved it for the nice... But this is know. my this is my Antietam battle one because it's the last one. Whoa. From McClellan. <laughs> See what I did there? Okay. Oh, nice! It's almost like you planned that weeks. No. <laughs> I was up all night practicing that, Mary. As a matter wow. of fact. Look at you yeah. go! I know. I do my I do my best. <laughs> well, I am drinking Hazy Sunset from Bayfield Brewing Company, which is just like 15 minutes down the road from me, and I'm drinking it out of my John Reynolds mug. Who? I may or may not mention John Reynolds on the show tonight. I'm kind of thinking I just might because. I think you might. I also think there might be an O.O. Howard mention at some point this evening. Mm-hmm. I think there probably will. Yep. I think there'll be a lot of things we're going to talk about tonight. Yep. But I think tonight's podcast topic, if you haven't guessed it yet, is going to be about the McClellan Lincoln relationship and a lot of stuff that's come out about that over the years we're going to talk about maybe some perception versus reality and of all the stuff i've read about specifically this topic 
no one really, everyone talks about McClellan and all of the mistakes and the slow and the overestimating the numbers and all the stuff that you read about the top line stuff. But there's not a lot of stuff talked about um, regarding why he was that way. What, what, what was his issue with Lincoln? What was the crux of the problem with them two? Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at that a little bit. We're going to kind of go back in time um, to, to the end of 1861. And we're going to talk about maybe what the issue was and see if we can try to figure out maybe and let the folks decide for themselves if was, was, was Mac justified being pissed? Was he overreacting? Was Lincoln, did he overstep a little bit? Did we? I mean, did he? Did he? That's my, that's my Riley yeah. pool. <laughs> um, but um, we'll look at that. And you can decide for yourself, Mary. We'll find out. We'll see what the, we'll see what the masses think. Yep. No, and I, I think this is a great topic. Like, I didn't know, like, you know, last week when we first talked, talked about it, we were going to do just talking about a little bit after Antietam and what happened with the meeting between Lincoln and McCollum. But then Darren had this great idea to explore the, the relationship between the two of them and just how it looks at, it's kind of like, I think it gets back to in, to what's called historical memory. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain parts of it that aren't actually looked at or explored. Like if you say George McClellan, everybody, you know, the first word that come, comes to mind is slow. He was arrogant. He was like a thorn in Lincoln's side um you know just oh, things like that but it's like anything to do with the civil war when you start yeah. looking at it a little bit deeper you start to mm -hmm. see a different side of it and and just to be clear to our listeners we are not gonna like we're not completely going 100 percent with mcclellan on this we're also not bashing lincoln at all we're looking at it um i would say objectively and we're exploring mm -hmm. evidence that is there just to show that there's two sides to every story and i think sometimes mac gets thrown Maybe thrown under the bus a little bit too much. Well, and yeah, exactly. I mean, you mentioned a couple of these. We look at the, you know, national perception is a thing, yep. but also pu public memory is another thing. What yep. people nowadays say. So you look at, you just look at some of the, the words comparing Lincoln and McClellan. So you look at Lincoln, you think of honest. You know, you, you, you think of honest. You think of the great emancipator. You think of save the union. You think of martyr. You think of. Uh, the man of sorrows. That was my favorite yep. one, you know, yep. but then you think of McClellan, you think of narcissist, right? You mm -hmm. think of self pity, hubris. He was probably the guy who returned the Tupperware without washing it. Probably. Oh, he totally would have been that fucker. Uh, he, he was that guy in the hot day where we said hot enough for you. That's who, yeah. all that stuff. He, you one know of my favorite songs. Asshole, you, you just you, yeah, exactly. But you know, <laughs> but you know, he, you know, but time goes on think of like a seesaw where lincoln gets more and more one direction and mcclellan gets more and more the other direction doesn't mean it's wrong it's just that's no. what the public memory is and i think when you look at the whole thing and it still goes on i remember you know years ago back when the u.s was fighting iraq we talked about this last night a little bit yep. mm -hmm. uh, uh george bush had a lieutenant general by the name of ricardo sanchez remember him mm-hmm you don't whatever okay but let's no i do okay. i remember do the you really war. yes okay my grandparents Ricardo. had it all the time and i practically lived with them okay ricardo sanchez <laughs> he he didn't get along with george bush they argued they fought they eventually left and you know what they called him in the media bush's mcclellan mm -hmm. i thought it was cool i mean not so much the gulf war but but i mean as far as how mcclellan even today was brought up when there's a conflict between a president and a general, McClellan's name still to this day gets brought up. And that's mm -hmm. the public memory. That's the whole public memory yeah. about, about George McClellan. Right or wrong? I mean, look, we've all done things, okay, that people remember us for, the good, the bad, and the ugly, especially you. And so as time, go, as time goes on, you have to look at what's reality and what's not. And, mm -hmm. you know, and – this isn't so much a fact-finding mission per se. Is, and I've always wondered, and this is what was a good exercise to your point. I've always wondered, what was it about Lincoln that got him, that he just got under his, his burr, under mm -hmm. his saddle, that freaking phrase is? Under the McClellan and, saddle. Under the McClellan saddle, yes. And I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot of it. And I, I, I think is in researching this, a lot of interesting things did come out. And not to um, say one's right or wrong, mm -hmm. but it's just interesting. And you can make up your own friggin' minds. And you know what? If you don't, if you don't like it, then who cares? But it, it's, but this is it it's is. just what it is. What it is. So let's real quick kind of go over the, the, the McClellan real quick. We, we talked about this uh, real quick. George Ben McClellan. Everybody, everybody knows him. West Point class of 1846, graduated with Pickett, Wilco mm -hmm. the the great Cadmus Wilcox, 
AP Hill in, uh, in Jack Stonewall Jackson. Yep. And, he, you know, everybody knows, he, you know, he fought in Mexico under Winfield Scott. Um, you know, he was, you know, he was only 35 years old in Antietam. I mean, he was still a young guy for the most yep. part. He hadn't, he hadn't fully grown yet. Obviously. He was one of the younger ones. He was still, okay. still little, you know, <laughs> literally um, and figuratively, yeah. <laughs> you know, he was an administrator. He was, he was the, the president of a railroad before the war. Um, but he had, you know, people realize, and maybe they do, he had a lot of success early. Mm -hmm. You know, he won those wars, at, um, those battles early in the war in Western Virginia, West Virginia uh, the Battle of, Battle of Philippi he won. And it really got him a lot of, of, of attention because that was the first land war. This is back in June of 1861. So it was the first land, land, land battle, I mean, mm -hmm. of the Civil War. And he got famous for that because, you know, what was going on not soon after that was, was First Manassas. And, you know, we saw what, what, you know, McDowell basically peed down his leg and, and he mm -hmm. wasn't going to, he wasn't going to be able to do that much more. But after that battle of Philippi, he, you know, he's promoted that the, you know, the New York Herald calls him young Napoleon. Yep. He isn't that nickname. And I'm sure he loved that by the way. <laughs> so Lincoln ended up promoting him to commander of the army, uh, of the Potomac after that first, first ball run loss. Um, and, and we've talked about this a million times. First thing he does, he looks at the army and says, this army's shit. Yep. It's a bunch of farmers, a bunch of carpenters. Um, I got to train these guys. So he spends about the next nine or 10 months or so really building and training and drilling these guys into what he called a capable army, mm -hmm. right? He um, decides to take his army on the road, ends up doing the Peninsula Campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is where he starts to get the reputation of being timid and sluggish and, you know, um, it, and everything was going on with that campaign. The, the, the Magruder thing at, at Jamestown comes to mind where he's, he's waiting outside of the battlefield and he sees the, you know, Magruder's marching the same guys around in a circle over and over and over again. Yep. And the clone thinks it's all these soldiers coming in. He's like, Oh shit. They got so many guys. And, um, and it just, you know, it ends up, it ends up being a complete mess. Uh, seven days battle comes along. Um, not soon afterwards. In the meantime, Joseph Johnson gets hurt. Yeah. Um, there's seven pines and we, will, and we will call seven pines, by the way. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Also um, called fair oaks. <laughs> sacks, sacks. Actually, well, that, boy, that, boy, did you get pissed on today with that? I was not pissed off about it. Ooh. I just, I was, he's lying. I was not pissed off about it. I, guess what? <laughs> but you know, so brings on the seven days battles. This is the, you know, that week from June 25th to July 1st. And, um, he gets near Richmond. Uh, basically, he's you know he's so close, um, the whole thing kind of falls apart. Um, he ultimately gets fired. They bring in Pulp. We talked about Second Manassas, and the whole thing fell apart. And this is really the beginning of when you really start to see, well, maybe publicly anyway, you start to really see McClellan start to really stew. Mm -hmm. He starts to get pretty, starts to get pretty pissed off. This is when he's writing his wife about the original gorilla and um, all this stuff, and he's calling Seward a puppy. Uh, Wells is a garrulous old woman. He hates Stanton with a passion. And that is going to really show after the Battle of Antietam mm -hmm. that he does not like Edwin M. Stanton at all. Although I mean, I'm, does not, anybody, does anybody I'm not know? a huge fan of Stanton, actually. No. Not, I'll just no. put it out there. I'm not. No, as you research more Stanton, we should do a podcast someday on why Stanton sucks. Just call it why Stanton sucks. Yeah. And just call it that, you know. But I mean, basically, you know, we did a whole podcast in second Manassas and John Pope comes over from the West and gets pantsed. Um, and he ends up getting beat. And now it goes back to that situation where Lincoln's like, shit, what, what the freaking hell do I do now? Um, you know, the, the, they have that, uh, they have that meeting with the cabinet mm -hmm. on September 2nd, 1860, 1861, uh, 1862 rather. And he, Everyone thinks he's gonna he's gonna get just get McClellan gone. Just whatever the hell we're gonna do. Pope's gone, but we're not bringing McClellan back. And then Lincoln changes turn, changes speed, brings in McClellan, lets him be in charge of Washington D.C. and for the defenses, and let him fuck around with that. Yep. But then Lee, on the fifth of September, invades the North. He invades Maryland, and so now Lincoln needs a commander. He needs a field commander. He brings back in. McClellan. Yep. The troops love it. They're all riding around yelling, Mac is back, Mac is back. Um, who assumed that's what they were talking about? Maybe the Big Mac was on at the McDonald's. At the, at the McDonald's, it's, it's actually And the Monopoly game was happening too at that time. Well, that's what they were trying to get those pieces, the Lego pieces. Exactly. 
There you go. Oh, yeah, they, oh, yeah, it's Lego. They were after the Legos. You know, um, but then, you know, basically, you know, Mac, he, you know, he, he ends up doing the, the Maryland campaign. And, yeah, he has his mistakes, Special Order 191, and he does all the stuff that everybody talks about. But he does – I guess he wins the battle. I mean, people say it's like a tie, but he basically wins. He pushes yeah. off. It was enough of a it, win for Lincoln to – to know that he could release the emancipation it was what he had been waiting for yeah um, because lee was back across the river again so that was enough that lincoln it was enough of what lincoln needed in order to get the emancipation out there which was one of the reasons i mean him putting mcclellan back in was both from a military perspective and like standpoint in that he had to use the tools he had and that was exactly what he told his cabinet there was nobody else he knew McClellan could organize the shit out of those men, and he knew that McClellan could raise the morale. But the other reason he did it too is McClellan was a Democrat, and he needed Democrat support for the emancipation as well as for the election. Mm-hmm. And of course, McClellan, he, you know, he, he's going to take the victory lap. He's, I got that quote from it. He writes to his wife. Yeah. Where he writes, picture the flowery music in the back. Picture Lorena playing in the background. Like this, okay? <laughs> what, actually, why don't, you, why don't you sing Lorena like you did the other night while I do this? Did I sing Lorena the other night? No, I didn't. Well, how much did I drink? <laughs> okay. What happened? <laughs> All right. So, so, so he writes to his wife, whose name is Mary, another, again, so you know what she's all about. Yeah. Those, those in whose judgment I rely on tell me that I fought the battle splendidly and that I was a masterpiece of art. I paid all that I could be asked to save the Union twice in this country. Twice, he says. I feel little pride in having with a beaten and demoralized army, defeated Lee so utterly well. Of these days, history will, I trust me, do justice. So he's saying, for one, he saved the Union twice. Well, I assume he's, he's talking about when he took over after Bull Run. I, I assume. That's right? absolutely what he's talking about. Okay. So he's he, talk, wrote, he's, he wrote letters back then, and one of the lines in them was like, I appear to have been called upon to save the land. And that's... You know how many, you know how many times I've said that? I've been nickel for every time I said that phrase. Uh, well. I guess you can just edit that one right out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but what is he does say? A, he does say a couple of things. <laughs> yeah, nice pause. But um, he does talk a little bit though. Um, some things that do make sense. It gives you a little bit of insight though on what's going on. He says basically, um, he. I feel a little pride in having with a beaten and demoralized army. And he's actually right about that mm-hmm. because when he, when he takes over Pope's army, the army's a mess. He has to merge three armies. We yeah. talked about this before. Army of the Potomac, Army of Virginia, in the, the, the expedition, North Carolina expeditionary group yeah. from Burnside. Mm-hmm. He's got to put all three together. Some of them like Mac, some of them don't like Mac. So he's taken over and taken them into battle, a group of soldiers who just got their ass thoroughly whipped, it's like in Manassas. And now they're invading the North and they're like, well, shit, here we go again. You know? So they were demoralized. There's no question. They were definitely demoralized. Yeah. So as you know, eventually he is going to sit in camp and he's going to wait and he's going to wait and he's going to wait. We're going to talk more in detail about this in a little while, but we're just doing the big, we're doing what's called the big picture, Mary yeah. right now. And then we're going to go down to the smaller picture. Okay. Yes. You cool with this? I'm cool okay. with it. You're not going to give me shit later for this. No. Well, okay. no guarantee. No. Okay, no promises, promises. <laughs> All right, so big, big picture. He's going to sit at Sharpsburg, and he's going to wait. Lincoln's going to get mad, and so Lincoln's going to say, Fucking do something, you know, and he's going to ultimately end up jumping on the Acela and taking a ride over to Maryland. He was probably, yeah. you know, he's probably had a presidential pass to get there quick, right yeah. at the front seat, okay? <laughs> so, he, so he finally got there, and he meets with him, and he says – he says, you know what, um, you need to go get him. You need to, you need to go chase him down. McClellan, this is, all, this is all perception right now. We're going to talk more yeah. in detail about this stuff. McClellan basically says, no, go stick it in your big tall hat. I'm going to sit here and relax. <laughs> right? And then a few weeks later, McClellan gets fired. He gets the old heave-ho. He, yeah. he gets, right? And, and then it kind of goes from there. And then it, it ends up, with, with McClellan finally leaving the stage of the military, you see him later on in the presidential election of 64, yeah. where he's going to ultimately lose. He's going to write a gigantic 476-page book, so it's basically like a Coddington book that is going to rip Lincoln 
and the horse you rode in on, everything he could possibly think of against Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. So that's the big picture, okay? And I think as we look at this, you know, it just seems that he, you know, that old, that old movie there, Anchorman, this escalated quickly, right? It, it this did. escalated quickly. It, it did. So, so what happened? What happened? What happened between them? I happened? think you have to go back to the peninsula. Play, play, the, play, the, play the counselor right now. The they're counselor. both sitting. They're both sitting in front of you right now. Not they're looking away at each other. They're pissed. So you bring them together. Say, guys, what happened between you two? What's this, what's the story? I think McClellan would say, go back to the Peninsula Campaign, mm -hmm. and look at what happened with my original plan at, to go through Urbana. I think it's even before that. I think it's before the Peninsula Campaign. I think it goes back to the very end of First Manassas, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you take a peek at it, um, he First Manassas happens. Yeah. The um, the whole thing's a mess. It's a complete disaster, you know. And he ultimately ends up basically he basically ends up taking over at that point from from McDowell. So he's 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 back in D.C. gets pushed back. Joseph Johnson and his army is still sitting in Manassas. They probably had some kind of extended stay at the Quinta Inn. So they were still, they were still sticking around there, the one off the highway there, if you've been there. Um, so he basically, he wants to basically, de you know, to deal with this one way or the other. Joseph Johnson is still going to hang around. He's not going to leave. Lincoln wants him out. Lincoln says, you know what? He's way too close to Washington. We got to get him the fuck out of there. He just he, he he can't. We can't have an army that big thirty minutes in the city. Just you know, despite the Beltway traffic, it would take four days to get there. You know, but he doesn't want them there. So um, this is where you know. So now, now McClellan comes up to your point, the Urbana plan. Yeah. So we're talking December eighteen sixty one, mid December, right around there. Yep. Um, Christmas lights are out. Probably very pretty looking. And he plans the, Urba, the Urbana campaign, which basically he's going to merge his army with the Navy that we're going to yep. see later on in Vicksburg. We're going to see this in Vicksburg down the road. So he's going to, he wants to take his troops and he wants to put them on the boats. He wants to steam down the Potomac into the Chesapeake Bay area, get onto the Rappahannock River and sail upstream to Urbana. And that's when he wants to attack the Confederates. That's what he wants. Yeah. And Lincoln pulls out his not so fast, my friend card. Yeah, he completely the, the stuff that Lincoln does here completely stalls McClellan. I when I was reading about this in more detail earlier um, today, when I was doing some more research about it, you know, like the Urbana plan just sounds, you know, it does it sounds a little bit like what was done at Vicksburg, but it sounds like a really great plan on paper. But mm -hmm. timing was everything with this, and because you know, Lincoln was like, whoa, 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 here's my plan, writes McClellan, and McClellan's got to read over his plan. McClellan writes him back and says, dude, like, I'm insistent, let's do, do my plan. So then Lincoln's like, okay, okay, well, you, then you got to put it to a vote. You got to have a war council, and you got to put it to a vote. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, McClellan must have been like, holy fuck, this is a war. Like, I, well, Mac, well, McClellan's Mac is pissed because Lincoln Lincoln loses his patience. He wants yep. he he says, "Listen, fuck that. You're not doing that plan. Okay, you can play on your boat later. Okay, here's yep. what we're gonna do. I want an all all army assault on Johnson. I want you to go right directly against Johnson, go southwest of, of Manassas, and mm -hmm. just just go get him." And Mac is like, you know, so he now he's pissed off. So he's like, "Well." Um, he's still going to sit there. So McClellan says, you know something? I, I got to go to Washington and talk to this freaking guy. So he goes to, he goes to the White House, and he meets with McClellan, and he, dude, what's the word? You fucker. No. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Dude, fuck you. <laughs> so so he, he basically says, I, I want to – I this plan will work. He says, I'm, you know, I'm, this is an aggressive plan, and we have to do it. Um, Lincoln so, – appears to acquiesce to this though mm -hmm. i don't know if, if you know he just basically says you know something to your point okay fine here's what you got to do <clears throat> you got to do it but i want you to take your 12 division commanders and you got to put a vote to them yep it ends up being eight to four in favor of mcclellan in case you're curious i did look up the vote and he gets what he wants but what to your point what is he losing 
he's losing time and he was time time to the point where Johnston has withdrawn and he's no longer there. So Urban is no longer an option. And the other thing that happens to Mac in this time is the Quaker gun incident Yeah, where it turns out that they weren't real guns. And like that happens happens a lot to Mac. Entire time. Like there was just like, it was like a string of bad luck and like, yeah, like, I mean, Mac, Mac should have known, but, but at the same time, like Lincoln took away a lot of time in having to, you know, be like, no, I don't want you doing this plan. Here's what I think should be done. And then Mac's having to go to Washington and then Lincoln's like, okay, put it to a vote. Like, I, well, and for whatever reason, you know how you, you get obsessed with stuff and it just gets in your yeah. head. Yeah, and it just—you know, you got to have it. He was obsessed with this plan. He was. He was. Yep. He was obsessed. It was his with baby. This plan. It was his baby, and he. It loved was his. It. it was his Chickamauga. It was his baby. It was his baby. It was Chickamauga's Chickamauga, you know. <laughs> and so he's obsessed with this. Um, and Lincoln, you know, Lincoln doesn't want Washington D.C. exposed, and that's the whole point. He's afraid that yep. if he takes and goes around, tries to get behind them, they're going to march on D.C. And maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. Yeah. But um. But to, what, to your point, we just said, February 22nd, which is the drop dead date that they wanted to attack mm-hmm. by, comes and goes. McClellan's still there. Finally, Lincoln says, You got to fucking go. And when he starts to move, what happens? Johnson leaves. Yeah. So Joseph Johnson is no longer Manassas anymore. So from December until the end of February, they were sitting there on their asses, literally doing nothing. Well, the Confederates yeah. regrouped, they trained, and they got the hell out of Dodge. Yeah. So it was a op- huge opportunity miss for the um, for the Union. Yeah, and McClellan you know? has to re- – he does retool his plan um, to disembark from Fort Fortress Monroe and advance up the peninsula that way. And that's mm-hmm. when you get into the peninsula campaign. Yeah. But before we, before we jump on the peninsula, okay, yeah. um, what – Think about think about your own life for a second. Mm-hmm. You're going to be McClellan for a second here. You guys are the same size. You're a five foot four, angry person too. <laughs> so you so we'll put you right in that spot, okay? Jeez. You're obsessed with something you really want to do, okay? okay? You this you, this is you you got to have it, okay? Yeah. And you and you see your boss, okay, back at your job, okay, yep. at the Dairy Queen that you. <laughs> She doesn't write the Dairy Queen. I but, but, Dairy Queen. I wish. Oh, I'd love Dairy Queen right now though. It's so hot down here. Anyway, so think about think about your job, okay? And you there's something you really, really, really want to do. Yep. And then your boss medals and dilly dallies and everything else you could think of. And you're starting to well, this is what I want to do. Maybe he's kind of fucking me around so I can't do what I want to do. And then he just it doesn't happen. How would you feel? I would feel like I feel like, okay, I had one job to do. And the per and I'm trained to do this job, and the person that is technically not trained to do the job is is kind of meddling. And I mean, like for Lincoln though, you know, he was trying. He was going and reading books on military stuff, and he didn't fully understand it. And I'm sure he had like opinions coming at him from all over the place, pressure, you know, like you wouldn't believe. But still, like if I was McClellan, you know, I would feel like. And I mean, McClellan's got a huge ego on him. So that's another thing to consider in this is like, if, if he's got that huge ego and he's had this plan and it's just basically been shot down and then he can't do it for whatever reason, like, yeah, he's, there's going to be a little bit of anger starting to form there. And this is a guy, McClellan, you know, West Point or all that stuff. This is a military guy. This is a guy yeah. who was in his mind, you know, he's been told he's a young Napoleon. He's, yeah. you know, he's, I mean, he's, He's, he's living the life. He's, and he sees this guy who is not really a military guy, who is a political guy. And he, this is really the first, first time that maybe McClellan started to think a little bit of like, you know what, I just, I just, I need to do my friggin' job here. And this guy's standing in my way. So he deals with that. And then the next step along the way is the peninsula to your point. Yeah. Right. So the peninsula is another one that, you know, and this is another one where you look at maybe um, how much of a meddler he actually, that Lincoln actually was. So, you know, Lincoln, he was very active in the military. He wasn't as active as, say, Jeff Davis was, though. Jeff Davis was thought he was, I mean, thought it was George Washington fighting for, yeah. you know, independence. So it goes back to the peninsula in 62, the Seven Days Battles. And there's that, there's that story that I, you know, we talked about yesterday that, that a lot of people don't really 
research as much. You know, what we know about the peninsula in the seven days is, you know, um, McClellan's army gets on the peninsula of Virginia and they're going to try to take Richmond and they kind of inch their way up the peninsula. And then, you know, they, they fight and they fight and they fight and, and they get pretty close. They get pretty close. Um, you know, at the Battle of Seven Pines, yeah. um, Joseph Johnson is May 31st, the same day as who gets injured on May 31st? Oliver Otis Howard gets oh, shot oh. twice in his right arm and has to have it amputated. And luckily for him, it grew back. Yep, it, it did. It certainly did. It did grew back. It was as go Darren proved today on Twitter, because everything yeah. you see on the internet is accurate. Yeah, don't look it up. It's true. He grew back. <laughs> and so May, May, May 31st, okay, Joseph Johnson gets injured. And they say that it was the best shot in the Confederacy history, even though it was a Union guy, because now June 1st takes over, and now, now we get Robert E. Lee. Yeah. So he's going to take over. Robert E. Lee, up to that point, had been managing the coastal defenses around Richmond. He'd been an advisor to Jefferson Davis. Yeah, he, he was really like had basically been, an administrative role. Right. Now he's a field commander. So it's similar to when McClellan took over after yeah. Second Manassas, except yeah. you know Lee is, is much you know, better at it. So um, he is doing his thing, and Jackson uh, McClellan, for the most part, is doing okay. Yep. I mean, he, it's, it's taken, you know, he's been a couple of months, he's been going at it, but all of a sudden, in May of 1862, Stonewall Jackson starts creeping across the Shenandoah Valley. Yeah. And he, and he fights Nathan, Nathaniel Banks from Mass, Wal Walton, Waltham, Massachusetts. Massachusetts my I got it. He did it finally. He almost said it right to Waltham, Massachusetts is a tough one for you to say. It's pretty close, pretty close. But he ends up, he, so he fights Nathaniel Banks. So he can write, he's on a whole, whole nother friggin' mess. But he's fighting Nathaniel Banks. Um, he's pushing him down the, the Shenandoah, gets him across the Potomac. Lincoln sees this and thinks, holy shit, I have an opportunity to bag Jackson. Yep. He's exposed. He's separated from the army. I can go get him. So you know how, how you know, how you are with the Twitter? You're kind of into the Twitter a lot. Yep. Borderline obsessed with the Twitter. Yep, Lincoln's link. Right. The telegraph. In the telegraph, exactly. So he's, yep. he's picture Mary with her phone tweeting <laughs> old pictures all the time. This is this is what Lincoln's doing with the Wait, telegraph. Wait, you're the same. <laughs> I I resemble that. Anyway, <laughs> he Lincoln is telegraphing. Now, you got a guy who's who now he wants to be part of this decision stuff. Yep. So what does he do? He's going to telegraph directly to give orders to General John Fremont, as well as, um, as, well as, as Irving McDowell. Now, Fremont is going to be west of the Alleghenies. He's going to be right in that in the mountains, versus McDowell is going to be in the Blue Ridge Mountains. So what he's going to do, he's going to telegraph both of them. He's going to have Fremont come from the west. He's going to have McDowell come from the east, and they're going to pull a pincer on Stonewall, and they're going to bag him. Okay, So he doesn't take McDowell's entire core, he takes out of the forty thousand guys, he takes thirty thousand. That's a lot of guys. Yeah, that's like a that's like that's like a ballpark's yeah. worth of people. He takes thirty thousand people away from from McClellan to go chase Jackson. And to Jackson's defense, he somehow gets out of it. They don't get him. But now, right when you were supposed to have that thirty thousand guys was supposed to be basically on the right flank of McDowell. That's where he was supposed to, of, of McClellan, that's where he's supposed to be. Now there's 30,000 guys missing. So now his army is significantly weak. So you know what, you know what Lee does? He's going to attack. He's going to hit them right there. Yep. And he's that, going like, right there. That was just, oh my God, I can't imagine what that would have been like for McClellan. You know? And if you read some of this, the stories after the fact, yeah. a lot of people gave Lincoln credit for that plan because they thought it was an audacious, that's a good solid word. It was an audacious plan for the president to do. But it really, it really was kind of irresponsible. It really, really was. Oh. Um, it, just, it was misguided because for one, he didn't tell McClellan. No, which is, you know, I mean, he, he should have told McClellan. Like, right. He didn't consult Mac. He told him after the fact, which yeah. is what he did. So now you have Lee basically, you know, he, he wants to fight a defensive battle with, with, with McClellan, which we'll see later on with Antietam, which is kind of a big issue with him getting fired. But he wants to fight defensively. He knows – he also knows that um, – Mac wants to fight defensively too. He t he starts to pull those maneuver in, you know, the, the, they call it the um, the battle of maneuvering is what they yeah. called it, where he's going to hit that weak spot on the flank. He's going to force McClellan out to attack him, and then he's going to pound him. 
He's going to pound them. Yeah. And at this point now, Jackson's going to arrive because that's what they do. They always seem to arrive right in the nick of freaking time. <laughs> He's got federal wars. It's like AP Hill and Antietam. Mm-hmm. Jackson's going to arrive. McDowell still doesn't have his guys. They're stuck. They're stuck at the in line at the pizza out at the Gettysburg again, probably. <laughs> and so the 30,000 guys sent by Lincoln, they didn't arrive in time. And so you've got a significantly weaker thing. Now, admittedly, McClellan thought that he had, you know, Lee was outnumbered, but at that moment, he kind of was, right? So you yep. see in these, these battles, um, McDowell's entire corps is supposed to support his right flank right when Lee hit. Yep. Um, so he pushes them over the north of the Chickahominy River, not to be confused with the Chattahoochee. Chatty. Whoa, look at you. See, I've been practicing. See that? Wow, and that was like your Massachusetts. <laughs> well, look at you go. You said say it properly. Oh, yeah, man, they got to time this one, definitely. <laughs> but whew. but Lee ends up putting, you know, uh, Fitz John Porter from the Fifth Corps, who we talked about in yep. the Second Manassas. Um, he's basically left to take that spot. And it takes Lee about two days to push him back. And it doesn't, doesn't take a lot long. He, push, he pushes him back. Um, and yet now you're playing the what-if game. What if Big Dowell had all his guys, right? Yeah. Could it have been different? You know? Um, some say it wouldn't have mattered. A lot of people, a lot of the, the Lincoln the apologists and all those guys will sit there and say, oh, it did, didn't matter. The Lee people, he yeah. would have beat them anyway. And maybe he would have. Who the hell knows? Yeah, it is. Um, but, I mean, again, it goes back to that question before. You're coming off of Urbana. Mm-hmm. Now you're in the now you're on the peninsula, and you're doing pretty well. And you can see the the spires. Is that what they call them those damn? Yep, the spires the, of Richmond. The they spires of Richmond. In like miles of Richmond, right. they can see it. So right he's there. thinking, I'm gonna. He's thinking, I'm gonna freaking. I'm gonna bag Richmond. I'm gonna be a goddamn hero, and I'm gonna yeah. end this war. And this is gonna be it. And now Lincoln pulls a bunch of his army away. Yeah. And he and he loses and has to retreat after Gaines Mill. Yeah, that would just be, right. I don't know. And so, I mean, in Link, not really defending Lincoln, but Lincoln is not there to see this stuff either. But this is an example, and we're going to see it until just after Gettysburg. And we'll, I'll mention this later too. But this is kind of like the, inter. it's not really interference, but it's the government having a huge hand in how the war is playing out. And it's affecting it. And it will affect the outcome of. It does affect the outcome of a, of a few battles um, that we will be definitely almost just, almost all the battles actually. Ex- yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it doesn't really. I I don't think Lincoln really realizes it until just after Gettysburg, just what the impact of that is. I mean, he also, you know, he kind of screwed up with Grant a little bit by sending, sending Charles Dana a spy on him, right? Yeah, well, Dan, I mean, Dana and Grant end up becoming friends. Right. But you can see, I mean, he's a – is Lee is, is Lincoln a micromanager? I, I would not – not in the same way that Jeff Davis was. I think Lincoln mm-hmm. had people – had men on his cabinet who were micromanagers, like I think Stanton was. I don't think Gideon Wells was at all, but I think Stanton was, and I think Seward was to some extent. But I think Lincoln was getting a lot of pressure, and he had to do certain things to keep certain people happy. Um, it's kind of like when he named Chase to um, be just chief justice of the Supreme Court. That was not a decision that he really wanted to make, but it was like he had pressure from from certain people to to do that for certain reasons. Mm-hmm. I think in this case, it's Lincoln's getting a lot of pressure, but Lincoln is also reading a lot about how the military works and all that. And at the time, he's still very new in his role as president. He's still learning as he goes, and he's going to make mm-hmm. mistakes along the way. Um, I would, but I would not say he's a micromanager in the same way that Jeff Davis was. I think he had micromanagers around him, though, and that was I, I would, I, I would, I would agree. I also think that Lincoln, in his defense, now was getting played a little bit by Stanton and Halleck. I mean, he, he was, yeah. Was. Oh, and Seward, you know. Seward, I mean, too. you know, pe- people give people give McClellan shit about the overestimated the numbers. Well, where do you think he got the numbers from? He got the numbers from Halleck. Yep, Halleck, and then and Pinkerton, you know, and then Pinkerton right. was adding five percent. So he was doing my style of math. Which, he was he was doing Mary math. He must have been Mary the same McCla- we Mary McCullen math. Mary McCullen math. And, you know, <laughs> she come, you know exactly. I got the math, but I mean, but so, so if you're if you're you're McClellan, and again, we're not trying to defend McClellan. All we're trying to do is we're just trying to put it out there to give you an even look at it. Just make up your own freaking yeah. mind, you know, about about what it is. Um, because he does get a bad rap at a lot of these things. He gets blamed for everything. 
I mean, he just yeah. does. So he's getting numbers fed to him that aren't true. Um, he's having Lincoln, you know, you know, either real or perceived, kind of meddling in everything he does. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And right. Um, the other thing about McClellan's personality is McClellan um, was not one that liked failure. So when failure was staring him in the face, he would start to kind of balk at it. And that was just who he was. I mean, McClellan was very, like, I mean, he was arrogant. He had an ego on him. He was narcissistic. He wasn't like Grant and Sherman who had experienced failures mm -hmm. throughout their life into adulthood. Yeah. You know, like I mean, careers and all that. Like they had not, ex he had I not mean, experienced that. I mean, no, I mean, I, it's, it's tough to experience failure as an Indians fan. You certainly know that feeling. Um, <laughs> I, I, cer I, I certainly don't Austin. think the city of, city of champions here with six World Series and all these other stuff. I mean, six Super yeah, Bowls and where were the Red Sox uh, this year? I don't know this Red Sox you speak of. Oh. You know what? They won the World Series two years ago. So I'm just saying, you know, there is a World Series. Indians fans, that need to, in case you're curious, there is a World Series. Here's your burb it. for the show weeks. No. But, but you've obviously handled failure pretty well. And so you got to think that he probably would have as well. Yeah. But speaking of failure, he ends up getting pushed off the peninsula after the seven days. And of course, he's going to get replaced because that's yeah. what they do. They're going to start replacing these guys left and right. So, um, and who do you think is pissed off about getting fired? McClellan right. must have just been, he's been basically told to go stand in the corner. <laughs> this, he's, that, that's probably exactly what he wrote when he, when he sat there. <laughs> he General McClellan? <laughs> He'd go stand in the go corner. The corner. <laughs> you can finish it. <laughs> go fuck yourself. Yeah. Ugh, I find a nickel for every time you've told me that. Darren, go stand in the corner. Go, <laughs> you know. But but you know, so he his dislike of Lincoln. I mean, before he's pissed, you know, he's pissed because he's been meddled, but he's still in command. Now yeah. he's fired. Now he's legit freaking pissed off. You know, because don't forget, he saw himself as the, you know, the, the young Napoleon. He was the one who was going to save the day. He trained yeah. the army. He had everything going. Um, the media is playing him up too. That's the other right. thing too. Yeah. Is like McClellan is like, think of some celebrity that's constantly in the newspapers. McClellan is like a celebrity general at this time. And the media is just feeding that ego that he has. Well, everyone well. loves a, mil a military hero. I mean, they do. I mean, you, oh, saw okay. a, yeah. you saw, you saw the grant stories in DC after the, yeah. after, you know, but I mean, I mean, McClellan saw all of this as his chance to be on Mount Rushmore. If, I know that wasn't existent then. I think it was existent back then. But, but he was, he was going to be one of those figure mastheads in American history. And he was probably on his way, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. He was going to be the first, probably the greatest general, arguably since George Washington, maybe, in his mind. I mean, true yeah. or perceived. You know, that's what he was going to see. Um, and then he writes that letter to Lincoln after, game, after basically gets fired. and says, you know, you have done your best to sacrifice this army. Yep. Oh, it's it's total pack your bags. We're going on a fucking guilt trip. Can you imagine if you told that to your boss? Oh, I would be fucking gone. If you said, you've done your best to sacrifice this Dairy Queen. <laughs> what they would say to you, how pissed they'd be. Oh, it would not it would not fly. It would not fly. I'm not. But that's what he does. Um and you know, in Historians and other people who study history, I guess would be a historian if you think about it. Other people who study history. Historians and people who study history um, would, basically, would basically use these quotes to create this image of McClellan. So mm -hmm. everything he did well was gone. And while you're just destroying McClellan, you're also building up Lincoln at the same time. It's natural. Exactly. Right? Yep. You know, and it creates this, this complete hatred of all things McClellan. Yep. Right now, who still? I mean, the people. You know, they always say the people who know you the best are the best. Just have the best opinion of you, whether correct or incorrect. Yeah. The people who still loved him were his soldiers, who were with him every single day. Absolutely. Right. They did. Yeah. So, so, so you think, well, all these guys love him, and I know, look, he was a flawed guy in a lot of different ways, but he sees in his mind, in this with again. A, opinion, not fact. He sees a plan. He's obsessed with Theodore Brown, a plan that is going to win. He sees the rug taken off from under him by Lincoln. Yep. Meanwhile, Lincoln's telling him, you got to be aggressive. you got to be aggressive. Then he goes to be aggressive. He goes, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know? yeah. Stop. 
you know, four score and seven years you're gonna wait, you know. <laughs> and so McClellan is McClellan is like, well, okay. He he, you know, licks his wounds, rubs it off, whatever the hell you want to mm-hmm. call that phrase. And now he gets a peninsula, and the same thing kind of happens again. Yep. Um, he's that close to Richmond, he can hear the bells churning, yep. right? You know, all and he gets put in. He, he had to have thought he had it. I mean, you got to think how close you can get. He, he could have tasted it. He thought it was going to be so yep. good. Two-month campaign, he's going to sack Richmond. He's going to be the king. He's going to be, you know, whatever. Yep. Um, so he's going to basically get, you know, um, he's going to basically get pushed off. And this is where you're going to start to see a lot of the stories come out against him about the whole lazy and sluggish mm-hmm. and James, Jamestown and all this other stuff. Because what people like in war, they like boldness, right? They like to yep. go get them, right? Um, and the pundits start to lack his aggressiveness. All these people in the newspaper, he's not aggressive. Um, he, you know, he's timid. And, and that's the thing about it, though, was the perception was Lincoln got rid of McClellan because he wasn't aggressive enough, yep. right? And so um, and it kind of goes back to Antietam again. Well, who the hell did he take? Who took over after Antietam? Burnside, who was, who was the, the most least aggressive, least like, aggressive like, general. And the story behind Burnside taking over is they basically went up to Burnside and they're like, "Do you want the position?" And Burnside's like, "No." And the guy's like, "Okay, fine. We're gonna go give it to Hooker if you don't want it." And then Burnside just hated Hooker so much. He's like, "Okay, fine. I'll take it." Yeah, Burnside to me is it's always perplexed me because Lincoln wanted somebody aggressive. And then, so, you, so you start yeah. to see maybe maybe you start to see some cracks in the overall opinion of McClellan, where people say McClellan they got rid of McClellan because he wasn't aggressive, yeah. right? He's aggressive in Urbana. He wants to be aggressive. He gets the rug mm-hmm. pulled off from under him. He wants yeah. to be he wants to be aggressive on the, on the seven days, and he's doing well. And again, the, the Stonewall Jackson comes out. So. It's the whole, you know, the, it goes back to that whole, the need to hate McClellan, I think, historically, right? And you begin to feed, you begin to feed the monster. Here's, McClellan needs to be hated. So here's why. We're going to throw all this stuff at you. But when you look at the stuff, it doesn't add up in a lot of ways. No, it doesn't. Like, like you're going to bash him for not being aggressive, right? But then I, you, you, anybody, like anybody who says that he was fired from not being aggressive has got to explain the Burnside thing to me because I don't get it. And no, no one does. I, I don't understand it either. And I mean, too, like the more I look at McClellan, like I did after the episode we did about Antietam, like, yes, McClellan made mistakes after Antietam, but I did come to respect him more as somebody who could organize the fuck out of an army. Um, you know, the one thing that I see a lot of, I guess, parallels with is with, with Howard just this whole, like, there's so much hate on McClellan. Well, guess what? There's a lot of hate on Howard. Like, mm-hmm. you mentioned Oliver Otis Howard. Everybody always says, oh, he fucked up at Chancellorsville. Like, and that's, that's all you ever, that, that's where they stop. They don't, they don't remember he won a Medal of Honor and all that. But, like, McClellan is, is kind of, I'm starting to see him in that same light that, okay, like, yeah, he was arrogant. He was a dick, whatever. But he did a lot of good in the with the AOP with organizing it and he was held back a lot by by government red tape there was a lot of that going on too do you know red tape is a civil war phrase I you do. know where it came from you know where it came from i'm trying to think uh oh is tell- that what that humming is that what that humming noise is fucker <laughs> When Civil War soldiers went to get their pensions after the war. Oh, right. Go to, go to Washington, D.C. to get their pension. And then when they got there, the pension envelope was wrapped in red tape. Do you know here in Ontario, we have a minister of red tape? I'm not, I shit you not. Really? Yep. You guys got all, you guys got all kinds of, you guys got Santa Claus up there and all kinds of stuff. So you yep, got all we have of a minister of red tape in our Ontario government. That's pretty close. That's why I want that job. You make them, I'll move to yep. Canada. You give me that, you give me that job. Yeah, the minister of all red right. tape. Yeah. I mean, he's something, something, something and minister of red tape. That's, that's pretty cool. Good yep. sense of humor. But when you look at the, um, this whole thing with, with McClellan, what does the government start to do now? Now they use McClellan as the state scapegoat for all the problems, right? Yeah. Perceived or not, you get that quote from your your friend Edward Stanton, okay, mm-hmm. where he writes and he you know he writes in his thing, if Mac had one million men, he'd swear the enemy had two million, and then he'd sit in the mud and yell for three. Yeah. That's the quote from Edward Stanton. So this is stuff he's saying. 
So what is that doing? He's taken the administration off the hook for all their mistakes they probably made by meddling. Yep. And he's putting it onto McClellan. And this begins to get that national subculture now. It begins to get that national perception. Yep. And national perception in time turns into historical memory exactly which never you, goes away if you look at the history of how stanton is with people stanton tend to do the whole michael corleone thing of like let's make it personal um mm -hmm. you can tell that michael corleone is not my favorite character in the godfather really <laughs> i'm team sunny um <laughs> Anyway, but if you look at stuff Stanton does down the road, in particular with, with Sherman, with his surrender to Johnston, and mm -hmm. how he totally throws Sherman under the bus with those terms, he does a smear campaign against him in the newspaper, which was completely uncalled for, and that was all because Stanton had something personal against Sherman. Mm -hmm. And I think Stanton, as you said, like excellent point, he's trying to deflect away from the government's, like just the, all the red tape they caused and they're putting it back on McClellan. Now here's another thing I know we talked about um, the other day, and this is not fact, this is just my own opinion. So take it for what it's worth, it means it's gonna be true, okay? So basically he, I think with McClellan was he was the beginning of the war and not the end of the war. Yep. Because don't forget the beginning of the war, they thought this was going to be a milk run. They thought this was going to be a 30-day exactly. war. This is going to be easy. And now McClellan's losing or having a tough time, and he's taken forever. When Lincoln is saying, this thing's supposed to be freaking over. Why the hell is this taking so long? And, and McClellan and Sherman in the West, they, they knew this wasn't going to be a freaking easy little thing. They knew it was going to be a long time. Absolutely so. Not. So it's taken McClellan a long time, and they don't like that. And so it's like, well, we want this thing to end. And as you, and you, and if any proof of that, if you think I'm wrong with this one, which you probably do, but any proof that you might think is wrong versus the later in the war, it took two months for McClellan to almost get Richmond. Almost, yeah. right? And that's and he gets run on a rail. He's exactly the and then Grant's it's, out in the West fucking Grant, around Grant, Vicksburg for nine months. Right. But but look at the it's Grant comes over the Overland campaign in sixty four. Yeah. It takes him nine months to get Richmond. Nine months yep. versus two. And it took McClellan a lot. I mean, granted, Lee's army was, was stronger. Yeah. What versus Grant. But it took Grant nine months. To get to to get to Richmond, he had to go through Spotsylvania and James River and Petersburg and you know, the Yellow Tavern. All those battles that went down in the Penin, uh, Overland Campaign. Yep. Nine nine months, they went through Cold Harbor. They lost seventy five hundred guys in fifteen minutes, and he doesn't get blamed per se for that. People realize that at that point, that the war was gonna was a hellish frigging thing at that point. McClellan did not get that respect. He no. got the whole, this war is easy, you got to win this, and it took a while. I think of McClellan, I think if Grant had, if they switch roles, I think if Grant was the guy at the beginning mm -hmm. and McClellan was the guy at the end, it would be the exact historical reversal. I, th I think, I you think see, so. I think you see McClellan will be the white hero because he yeah. would have taken his time and he would have, he, you know, he would have, he was aggressive. I mean, Lincoln finally took the, the Training wheels off of Grant said, "Fuck it, do it. Fuck whatever the hell you want now. Fuck the whole Yeah, you know? well, I mean, he lets him do Vicksburg for like nine months. Even he, I mean, he is writing him saying, "Like, oh my God, like what's going on out there?" Kind of thing. Um, but yeah, like at the time, the perception of the war in the media was that you know there was that quote where it was like, "This is going to be a war that the blood spilled is going to feel like a thimble," and that was it. Well, oh, he said it was like a handkerchief, right? Yeah. No, I think it was a thimble. I think it was a handkerchief. I think, I think he said. I, I think he said with a blood being spilt, you could clean it with a handkerchief. I, I will bet you. Yeah, you okay, that. go to the film. Go to the film, okay? You can send your apologies to DJ Weeks 41 at yahoo.com, okay? <laughs> Jesus. So, but I think going to the overall point, though, I think these guys weren't treated the same, and I think a lot of it was timing. I think that was a big, big part of it. I think McClellan was – still under the impression that the war was going to be easy at the time and grant the end was um they realized it was a different type of war than they thought and they gave grant a lot more leeway okay i have your answer well yeah. after a lady's thimble will hold all the blood that will be shed okay that's not right that's bull that's bs there's there's another quote sorry maybe we're both right there's another quote that says with the handkerchief i've seen it 
Well, I just read the Lady Thimble one, and I heard it in Justin Martin's uh, book about Antietam as well. All right, well, you go in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we're both right, fucker. I, maybe, we're, maybe we're both right. I, Holy you know fuck. I think we're both right. But you quick to prove me wrong. Anyways, okay. So I think when you... <laughs> so we get to, we'll get to Antietam, you know? Okay, we get to Antietam, and he eventually gets fired. Yep. And we're going to talk, we're going to talk in a few minutes about some of the letters that people wrote about this. Yep. Some people we will play a little game. Or I'll read a quote and you tell me who they were. How's okay. that for an idea? All right. Okay. That sounds we'll, good. Okay. I'll make up for that disgusting display a few minutes ago. You know, we were so, probably both right. I was probably both. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Say it. Actually, Darren, actually, actually. you know, <laughs> You know what, Mary? It's nothing you need to be ashamed of. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. <laughs> maybe, maybe somebody will hear that story. But, um, maybe. <laughs> but, but so Lincoln, he, he, gets, he gets rid of Mac, okay? And you can tell Lincoln at this point has had it with McClellan. And yeah. you got to look at a little bit of the backstory here is it goes back to that September 2nd, 1862 he put he went on the limb for McClellan. He did. He did. Everyone wanted him gone. So now Lincoln feels that McClellan, he's not he's acting slow again. He's not he beats him in Antietam. He's gonna get his emancipation proclamation. Yep. But in his mind, he's gonna to need to go chase down Lee and beat him. We're gonna see this later on at Gettysburg with Meade. Yep. Same deal. Okay. Um, and so Lincoln writes a really fantastic mean girls letter. September 13th, which the, yeah. we are recording which on is the anniversary on this day. of this letter. And I have the original letter here. Oh, do you? I do. I got it. Me and Ben Gates went and got it. It's got it right here. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'll read this letter to you right now. Okay. So this is, this is October 13th, 1862. Lincoln writes to Mac, you remember me speaking to you of what I called you about being your overcautiousness or not your overcautious when or not your overcautiousness when you assume that you could not do what the enemy is constantly doing. Should you not claim to be at least his equal in prowess and, and act upon his claim? And then he goes on, um, it is it is is it as if easy for our troops to march well as the enemy, and it is unmanly to say you cannot do it. Which is, a cla- which is a classic, which, which is a classic, and the horse you rode in on. That's a whole in the cavalry you rode in on quote from Lincoln. The shade. That's prod, prod, the bitchiest letter Lincoln's wrote, I think. Do you think? That's shady. Like that's four score and go fuck yourselves. It goes. It is. Yeah, he's basically right? saying like, you, you know what, dude, you need to move, or you need to just go stand in the corner and go fuck yourself. Yeah, exactly, and. Obviously, there are other letters that went back and forth, and in full disclosure, we couldn't find them. Yeah, we <laughs> were we looking looked. for them. We couldn't find them. I, I um, think I was reading this letter today, too, and I think it's like, you know, Lincoln at the time, he had spoken to his secretaries about it, and he had said that he was going to basically give McClellan a chance, like one more chance, and that was it. And this was that letter. But what Lincoln doesn't I don't think what Lincoln grasped completely was the state that the Army of the Potomac was in after Antietam. Well, I think that's a that's a big that's a big thing, and we're going to go about that. Um, and and I we have some great quotes to talk about that. Is people don't realize the army, you know, after Antietam, you know, we got to remember too. McClellan took over this army, and it was a mess when he took it over. And this is just a few weeks before, and yeah. it wasn't all it wasn't all this. Um, and the army of of the Potomac was basically um, was basically in a complete friggin' utter mess. Yep. And and the perception is that um, he had Lee on the rails. He had a beat. All he had to do was just stick his hand out. And he was that quote later on with Meade. You, you had him in your fingers. You just need to close your hand. Yep. Right. Then, but it, this one was a little bit different because uh, Lincoln, you know. Um, you know, he ba- he basically was was McClellan was like, you know, he intended he was gonna just gonna stay in Sharpsburg. He had no intention of doing a, a campaign, and that that was part of his big thing. You're not being aggressive enough again. 
You don't want to do, you just want to sit on your ass here and this, and you have no intention to campaign. And that got debunked on a letter I found that he wrote, that McClellan wrote to his wife on September 2nd, uh, 22nd, 1862. And I quote, Ahem, I look upon the Maryland campaign as substantially ended and my present intention is to secure Harper's Ferry and hold it with a strong force, then go to work and reorganize the army and ready for another campaign. So he was, he was ready to move. He wanted to reform. Yep. He wanted to go get Harper's Ferry, and he wanted to go get him. So that goes completely against the, in the face of, of, of what Lincoln said. Now, could McClellan be bullshitting his wife? He's not the first guy to lie to his freaking wife. That's what I mean, some of, the, some of the um, – <clears throat> right. <laughs> 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 some, some of the letters that um, McClellan writes to his wife are pretty grandiose and over the top, you know, mm -hmm. like his letter after the ban battle of Antietam, where he's like, the spectacle yesterday was the grandest I could conceive of. Nothing could be more sublime, you know, that kind of stuff. So he is writing her some pretty grandiose stuff. Yeah. And the story, again, that the perceived story, the national memory says that Lincoln did everything he could to push Mac, including the October 4th visit to Antietam. Um, and then on the on ten six, Lincoln ordered Mac to move. Mac remained and complained his supply requests were not met, and it was impractical to move. And so what? And that's going to be. We're going to get some good quotes on that here in a second because what what Lincoln is saying is, I told the fucking guy to move, and yeah. he's bitch. He's bitching about supplies, and that's not an issue. Blah blah blah. And but if you look we at went, the quotes, if you look at the history, we went we went to the Civil War Breakfast Club vault and the headquarters over here <laughs> to, to dig out some letters that Ben Gates got for us, okay? Um, and there was a lot of quotes that completely, I don't want to say exonerate McClellan with this, but they basically, um, they basically proved that the supply thing was wrong. Now, what surprised me about these quotes was up to that point, Rufus Ingalls had did a real good job as a quartermaster, yeah. but he did a lot better with the, with the like, ammunition and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But the clothes and the food was a freaking mess. So and the shoes, a, the shoes and the, were and the, the biggest shoes. thing. The shoes were the biggest thing. So you say Antietam was fought over shoes? No, it's fought over Legos. But you better tell Ted Burns. Got that fought over Legos. You know, so basically there's a captain in the 27th Indiana. His name is Edmund Brown, okay? Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with Doc Brown. Edmund Brown, okay? Great Scott. Many of the regiments were shoeless. Pants were torn at the seat frayed at the bottom with no coats or no coats at all or torn at the seams. It's like you leaving the mine, actually, is what it sounds like right here, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's foreshadowing my future. Yeah, isn't it? exactly. You Good. know, <laughs> as quartermaster, okay, uh, he, he notes the regiment was in worse shape than he's ever seen in all of history. That's a quote he has. So what these people are saying, this guy says, is these, uh, these guys had no shoes. Their pants, their asses were hanging out of their pants. Their, 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 their jackets, if they even had a jacket, and this is going into September, which is getting pretty cold, yep. right? So he wants supplies. He said, before we're going to go in this campaign, we're going to be going into Virginia. We have no supply line. These dudes have no shoes. They got no pants. Their, their asses are hanging out. You yeah. Know? And they've got to get the supplies before they get into Virginia because they're going into enemy territory at that point. So they got to get it when the supply lines are open for them. Right. Exactly. So Lincoln said attack while the roads are open, but it doesn't make a difference. Colonel Charles Wainwright from the artillery who fought at Gettysburg was a big guy mm -hmm. at the Gettysburg. Yep. He writes a good deal of suffering among our men of want of clothing, especially blankets and shoes. I don't suspect we will remain here long in Sharpsburg. But still, our supplies have not come, and they were promised from Washington long ago. Yep. So this is 926, 1862. The Battle of Gettysburg, of Antietam was 10 days before, nine yep. days before. Yep. Now, you can roller skate backwards with your four wheels and your tight shirt and shorts and your headband, like we talked about, <laughs> yes. backwards from Washington to Sharpsburg in 10 days. Maybe I can't, I can't but you probably can. Okay? No, Maybe that would be a disaster. Just don't forget your whistle. You know? That'd be worse than me singing, actually. Uh, okay. But again, <laughs> the, 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 these supplies. And what's interesting about the Wainwright letter is he thought they were coming. It sounds like that we were expecting supplies and they fucking not yep. coming. And this is some things we'll see more later on with this administration on Fredericksburg down the road with promised things that never came. Yep, which we're going to talk kinda, about. 
right? And so it's, it's what I'm saying is this is a common thing. And for McClellan, again, fact, not fic, fiction, not facts, or opinion, not facts, that this is what he's dealing with, okay? Um, you know, uh, Burnside is another, another quote I have from, from early October 1862. Burnside rides with Lincoln. You know, he rode with Lincoln. Uh, yeah. It's in Sharpsburg. It mentioned one of his regiments, the 9th New York, suffered greatly from a loss of meat and vegetables, mm-hmm. and they were always, but they were always assured the food was coming soon, and it never came. Yep. So again, this is another guy. So uh, they, for whatever, whether it was true or not, they were under the impression that before we go campaign again, and if you're going to believe McClellan's letter to his wife that they were going to go, but they were waiting on supplies. And mm-hmm. it didn't sound like they were waiting for stupid shit. They weren't waiting for, you know, no, they were rough. waiting. They were waiting for, for food. They're waiting for shoes and they're going to need the shoes, especially coming up because the weather's getting colder, but you can't be marching your troops. And the one thing about McClellan is he cared immensely about his troops. Like he wanted yeah. to be well supplied and all that. Okay. Like you're not going to, you're not going to take them somewhere where they don't have adequate supplies because you're going to wear yourself out before you even get to the enemy. Yeah. And the, these aren't, I mean, you know, Marcina Patrick, who was a division commander, actually yeah. a brigade commander in the first corps at Antietam. He says the officers and men were without clothing. Now he might've been Hooker and Butterfield. We don't know, but it, you know, <laughs> But what they're saying is these guys had no clothes. I mean, they're, they're, I don't think they had they some clothes, but I mean, they, they were, they were, were out. but they were torn out to the, the yeah. point you were saying before. Elijah Hunt Rhodes, one of the guys we talked about, I, I have his diary and I looked at his diary because I, I wanted to get a quote from Antietam because I knew he mentioned it. He writes, um, good Rhode Island guy, by the way, Ben Frail, thinking yep. of you. Yep. Okay. <laughs> hey, Ben. Um, see, see him waiting. He's, hey. He says, so, so, so Rhodes says, in spite of our old, torn and ragged clothes the troops looked well and the lines stretched over hills and plains so again he's putting a, a positive spin on he said the people are in, they're in good spirits but their clothes i mean this is a common theme about this um and so uh it's it just basically it just it just it basically just goes with the whole thing where you know um lincoln told mac and this this is where it gets funny too is when Lincoln left McClellan, he basically told him, and I, and I quote, you know, he told me um, when, it, when he was leaving, he said that he was entirely satisfied with me. It would stand by me at all, at all comers, right? So he says Lincoln told him, I got your back. Don't worry. And that obviously didn't happen. Now, I'm going to read you this one more quote, and I want you to tell me who this is. Okay. And I think you know because we talked about this, but pretend you don't, okay? Okay, yeah. All right. Um, we are in the heavy expectation of marching orders. We have been determined here by the failure of the government to push forward reinforcement and supplies. Um, telegraphing was requested of supplies is sent back as early as October 7th, and we have not received them yet. So mm-hmm. who said this quote? That's George Gordon Mead writing. To George his wife. Gordon Mead. He's writing George to Gordon. his wife, Margaret. Right. So George Gordon Mead is saying, we're planning on going. We want to go. Everyone wants to go, but we have nothing. We have no food. You know, you know, we have no food, we have no supplies, our pets' heads are falling off. You know. <laughs> and that to go. So again, it paints that picture of did McClellan really sit on his ass and didn't teat him and not move? Yeah, because he, he just because he just didn't want to go, or maybe, just maybe, he wanted to go and didn't feel his army, who he'd been developing and training and all these years was not equipped to go ahead and adequately fight Lee. Yep. And that's, you know, it, it's interesting. The one thing I was thinking about, you know, so here's McClellan not moving because he feels that his army is not equipped enough and he doesn't want to because he does have the best. I mean, despite how arrogant and narcissistic he is, he has the best interest of his army at, at heart and he doesn't want them to like, I mean, again, it goes back to the failure thing, but um, you know, so Lincoln writes him that letter. And basically tells him to get his ass in gear. And McClellan's like, don't need to get me fucking supplies. And November 5th, I hope I'm getting the date right, he's fired. Mm-hmm. So you flash forward to July 1863. And uh, General Meade is now in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And he doesn't pursue Lee right away. And Lincoln writes him a very, you know, 
basically, why aren't you doing this? Like just tearing a strip off in letter, which he never sends, which good for Lincoln. But I think the thing that Lincoln, or that Lincoln realized in that he reread the letter and decided not to send it. I think he realized, holy shit, this is what McClellan was going through at Antietam because Meade is basically doing the exact same thing. He's telling me mm -hmm. his troops are not in any shape to move. He's lost X number of division command, a core commanders, division commanders, you know, and I think Lincoln, I think that's when that was kind of the turning point for him when he realized like McClellan wasn't making shit up. McClellan wasn't moving for a reason. Nope. I'm now seeing it. I'm seeing it now with Meade. And you see after that, a bit of a shift in how Lincoln does things. And the other thing too that um, calls back, that just shows just the government involvement in the red tape is in June of 1863, John Reynolds is called to the White House to have a meeting with Lincoln and Lincoln offers him the position in the Army of the Potomac. And Reynolds is like, no fucking way unless you can tell me you're not going to interfere unless I can have full control. There's no way I'm taking over this army. And Lincoln's like, nope, I can't do that. And the one thing about Reynolds is he was good friends with McClellan and he was probably privy to a lot of the stuff that was happening. So I think those two examples right there are kind of illustrating to what you're saying, Darren, about this, like, you know, well, you need to look at more from McClellan's perspective and what was going on. Well, perceived or reality, yeah. there was it was like, you know how like, um, you know, you mentioned the whole job thing again. Someone's going to take a position in a job and everyone says, you know what? The boss is a dick. Don't take the job. He's yeah. just going to micromanage you. It, maybe this is one of those cases because clearly word got around oh, that, yeah. that Lincoln and Halleck and Stanton and the rest of the cabinet were going to be having your thumb on you wherever you go. They're yeah. going to tell you what to do. They're going to do orders. They're not going to tell you they're going to do them. They're going to tell you after the fact. And then you know what they're going to do? When it fails, they're going to blame you. Yep. And, that's, and that's a common theme throughout this administration. Now, fact, truth or not, that's the perception. It's obvious that the generals had because the proof, to your point, is the Reynolds story. Because I would think that if you're John Reynolds, West Point guy, you know, a hero, the whole deal, that would be his dream job, wouldn't it? Oh, ab absolutely. You know? He has seen – he saw McClellan go down – he saw Burnside go down and he saw Hooker go down and he was probably like he was friends with McCall and he was probably privy to a lot of shit. Well, the fact that he asked Lincoln, he says, if I take this job, will you tell me that you're not going to interfere in metal? And Lincoln's the, like, fact no. that, the fact that he even asked that knew that. And so yeah. either he saw it, which he clearly saw it, or they told him just so you know, the boss is going to be a dick. He's going to be all over your ass. So just, just yeah. try to set that up. And so it goes to show that that he was, you know, I mean, look, the end of the, the end of the day, Lincoln helped win the war. He, all the stuff that we said at the beginning, free the slaves. Everything is absolutely right. Okay, he it did is. all that stuff. Yep. But I think you got to look at the at the other side of the coin, though, that the people, and again, this goes back to this national historical memory now, mm -hmm. that it's important to look at these other guys in, in, in real time and not with 150 years of hindsight and reading all the books and hearing all the shit about these people. Whether you like McClellan or not, it doesn't even matter. What matters is you got to look at the plight he had, put yourself in that same shoes, and think maybe he was trying to do what he could, and maybe he was being held back. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stuff that we're told about the slow and the sluggish and the overestimating, there's more to the story. And I think it, that story needs to be researched a little bit more. And, and that's yeah. what I came coming out of this was I think McClellan, had a lot of promise. I think he was very arrogant. I think he was very egotistical. Yeah, he but saw who himself wasn't as he? Warren was no. arrogant. Warren was no, arrogant. Right. A lot of them right. Were. But, but I think he saw himself as the guy who was going to save the country. I mean, you look at that early that early letter. He said, "I saved the country twice yep. now." So he really thought. So he, you know, he's no he's no angel either. Mm -mm. But I think I think in his mind, you know, the, you know, the the victors get to write the stories. And as soon as as soon as he got fired from Antietam. And he began to run for president in 1864. He wrote that 476-page diatribe yep. bashing Lincoln. And he made that his campaign. And, you know, and I, you wonder how much it was 
wanting to end the war versus how much you want to just beat Lincoln. And and I think I think when you look at the whole thing and the stories written, I think it's just important to look and just see maybe there's more. Like I said, there's more to the story. There's McClellan always more. To, there's always more to the story. And I mean, the historical memory thing. The. the the most prominent place it's seen is in Sherman's March to the Sea. But I think the historical memory thing needs to be applied to more situations in the Civil War like this. Like I said at the beginning, we're not bashing Lincoln. We're not putting him down. But we just want people to think about the other side of it. Like, look at it from McClellan's perspective. And then, you know, you look at the evidence. Like, you look at Reynolds turning down the job because he had probably was like, I don't want to be micromanaged because I don't want to be the next one fired when the when we lose the battle like that's that's where they were at with it but too and then you look at the letter that lincoln writes to meade and then he doesn't send it and i think that was kind of oh. lincoln's moment where he was like shit mcclellan actually was not moving for a reason and he sees that meade is not moving because he's got the interests of the army at heart he's not pushing them because he knows they can't do it. And McClellan but, too. Well, I Well, the pre-64 election, the post-64 election, Lincoln's totally different. Oh, he and really I think, is. And, yeah. and I think it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of this a, a while ago now, is I think the perception was the war was an easy win. It was a two-foot putt. And Absolutely. the lo the longer it took, the more it made Lincoln look bad. And I think yeah. there was a lot of politics involved. He wanted a quick blitzkrieg type war to put them away. Yeah. Um, but I don't think Lincoln realized like McClellan did, and certainly Sherman did, that this was not that war. This war was going to be long, it was going to be grueling, and it was, it was going to cost hundreds of thousands of lives and millions and millions of dollars to win this. They were going to have to go into the South and just and just destroy them. They, they knew that's yep. how it had to be. And Lincoln at the beginning thought that he was going to call up the 75,000 guys, and they were going to go down there, and it was going to be like you know paintball. They were just going to go finish these guys off, and it was going to be over. And that's how a lot of people thought. I mean, yep. And it didn't turn out that way. And that's why I think that if McClellan had been put into position later, if he took over the army around the Overland campaign, because mm -hmm. um, their confederation was done after Atlanta, they were done. Oh, yeah. And if, if he would have won that, he would have eventually taken Richmond. Maybe he ends up being the hero. And who knows? He's still McClellan, still McClellan. He's still the arrogance and all that stuff. But, but I, think, um, I think a lot of the stuff written about him is, uh, is unfair, personally. No, That's I do too. Opinion. No, That's no, I, I, no. I, I, one hundred percent agree with you about that. I've been thinking that since. Again, this is why I, one of the reasons I love doing this podcast with you is I'm doing like, yeah. <laughs> he's just brushing off his shoulder for some reason. <laughs> he's proud of himself. Oh, Apparently. I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm just gonna sit over here and be right. Yep. God. Um, Anyway, getting back to my point that I was trying to make there, <laughs> um, I've started to respect McClellan more, see things a little bit differently. Um, you know, it's really interesting when you start to do just a closer look at stuff and examine what's out there, how different it is, you know, how much historical memory is playing into the Civil War with, with things, not just the March to the Sea, but with the perception of McClellan, which, like, I still say McClellan was an arrogant bastard. but. Mm -hmm. Does he deserve the reputation he has? I, I don't think he does. I, you know, like he was going to, he was having to fight with a lot. He's having to go through with the bureaucracy in Washington. And we're going to see that with Burnside at Fredericksburg. I think Hooker goes through it as well. They all experience it. You know, and if you're the lead general and you, like, you're going to be the one on the chopping block, it's kind of like if you're the CEO of a company, then you are the one that falls first. Well, exactly. Here's your chance to do it. Go win me the war in 10 minutes. Yep. You know, and then they try. Yep. Um, but I think by researching this, it proves a couple of things. I think McClellan was more aggressive than people think he was. Yep, absolutely. Um, I, th I think he was getting fed bullshit numbers from the cabinet mm -hmm. as far as what he was, what he's fighting with. Yeah. But, but, but the biggest indictment, I think, and, and Lincoln doesn't have any, have any fingerprints on this at all. But no. you see what stands in, especially with that one quote about the troops. He yep. blames he, they blame they blame the generals yep. for all the mistakes. They blame you know every single one of them. You, you every guy who went went through it, you get his ass to kick out the door. Just you know, it's, you see you later, and they just trash him. Um, and Mc, yep. but McClellan was the worst. McClellan was the worst. He was a target. He brought a lot upon himself because he wrote a lot of letters himself, and he said a lot of stupid things. 
Um, haven't we all, you know, but yep. he, um, you certainly haven't. Oh, I have. Trust me, I'm going to be hearing about it for the next 30 some years. Oh, you certainly <laughs> But I, th- but I think, I think so at the end of the day, know. oh yeah, shit. But I think, but I think at the end of the day, it proves that every, every one of these guys you look at, we've been fed a line of history our entire lives because no one's a Confederate, no one's a Union, no one, none of us fought there, none of us were there, yeah. but we were taught a certain line of thinking. Um, and some of it is, is reality, some of it's fact, some of it's fiction. But like anything else, don't just read. Always question what you read and yeah. see what the best thing is and make up your own decisions. Because I think if you do, you'll find that some of the stuff you've been taught maybe is a little bit embellished to help an overall, you know, an overall agenda that people might have. Yep, absolutely. There's and- always an agenda. That's why I say like when you're reading, I mean, as, as wonderful as Grant's memoirs are, he has an agenda. Same with Sherman, even with Howard, you know, their, his autobiography, they all have an agenda. And you have to look at different things and to really understand what was going on in this war, you know? And I mean, Lincoln was a brilliant man. He's a brilliant president, but you know, he's having to find his way through something that has never, he's in uncharted territory too. And he's going to make mistakes along the way. And Stanton, you know, probably my least favorite cabinet member and, uh, for, for many reasons, but yeah, like yeah, he's a dick. Yeah, he is. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, though, just, just what he does to Sherman because he's out and he's out to get Sherman. You can see that, you know, during the March to the sea, you can see it when he gets to Savannah and all this other stuff that, that he's out to get him. So there is, if you look at like the evidence, even that happens after that, when it's not a one-time thing, it's like, okay, this is a pattern with this person. You know, you start to see the bigger picture, and I'm I'm really glad we explored this in this episode. And I think it's kind of I would like to explore more of this in other episodes. I think other kind of historical memory and look at okay, well, what might be the actual case with this when you start looking at it a yeah. little bit closer? Yeah, know? and again to your to your point, Mary, at the beginning, it's not about you know McClellan's right, Lincoln was wrong, or vice nope. versa. You know, it's like anything else. It's this, you know, he sheds, he said, she said, and the truth is somewhere in, well, probably she said, but yeah. in somewhere, somewhere in the middle is usually how it goes, right? And so the whole thing is researching enough to make up your own decisions. You know what? If you think McClellan's a dick, which he probably is, that's totally cool. Oh. If you think Lincoln, Lincoln is fucked up, that's totally cool too. But it's important to look at both sides of it and help make up your own decisions. So mm-hmm. check it out. Um, there's always some good resources to get out there and read it. But I think, um, I, I think it's a pretty good study to look at and just get an idea of maybe and just to see how how legit these guys really are with their stuff and just you know it's just a lot of the stuff you've been read is the stuff that's been agenda driven so yeah absolutely and, oh, yeah so well, I think that's a good place to wrap up because we I are think it definitely is. over our one hour <laughs> yeah I'm all about an hour and fifteen minutes you can have some editing to do Mara yeah I am <laughs> I will but I enjoy doing it so um, that was. Thank you to Darren for doing a lot of the research for this episode. Um, did awesome on it. So. Oh, you know, thank you very much. You know, I, 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 <laughs> hey, I, I am just happy to be part of the team, Mayor. Hey, well, I'm happy to have you along with this. So, oh, geez, want to do it anybody else? Ah, <laughs> oh, look at you, look at you. Now I'll just go stand in the corner over here. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Probably call you a fucker as soon as I stop recording it. Yeah, I usually do. Anyway, um, yeah. So, so just, so just some, um. House, uh, housekeeping. Once mm-hmm. again, we'll be uh, jumping on Facebook Live on um, on 10 a.m. on Saturday to talk, well, on paper anyway, about McClellan. You know, I hope people do want to talk about McClellan. So I think that'd be a cool thing to talk about. I think yeah. people would like that. Um, so. Or anybody wants to talk about a week from Wednesday, we're going to be doing our inaugural Civil War Breakfast Club roundtable. Ooh la la. Yep. So if you're, if you're interested in doing that, you have to email us quote mary yep. at civil war, civil war breakfast club at gmail.com and one of us mary will be responding to you in and then we'll get a little group together and then she some one of us mary will email the zoom code to you yep. so we can do it so it's going to be a lot of fun it's not going to be a lecture it's not going to be some stuffed shirt reading us dusty no. books we just want to get together and talk about whatever's on your mind Make it yep. fun, just like the lives do. So yep. that'll be cool. Uh, next week we are doing? We are doing episode 10. So we are doing something fun for that. 
we are going to, each of us is going to bring a few generals that we would like to have a beer with. Oh, that's right. Tell the other what we're doing. So that's, it's going to be kind of a fun, lighthearted episode. The week after that, we are going to be hoping in dates, right? We're going to be talking ghosts with our guests. We are going to be doing the Ghosts of Gettysburg. We're going to be talking with our friend Jen Price, who yep. we call Jay Price. Yep. And she'll be coming on talking some cool ghost stories. And we'll talk about that right around the Halloween season before you, uh, Mary goes out and eggs those cars and toilet papers those trees. And <laughs> we'll, be able, we'll be able to get out there and, uh, and talk a little bit about some ghosts. So, let's, so we're going to have some fun. These next couple weeks, we're going to have some fun. Then we'll get back into November. We're going to do some yeah, November's a stuff. busy. November is a busy Civil War related month for us. And um, we are actually going to be putting out some videos just to tell you guys what we're getting up to each week too we're gonna try and start doing a little bit more of that because we can do that on twitter let you know what we're going to be talking about but yeah november is going to be probably gettysburg address franklin battles for chattanooga all that fun stuff a lot of some some good stuff on the horizon so the dance yep. card mary is full so yes anyways this is always a good time with you. It was always a pleasure talking, nerding out with, with yep. you as always. And um, so we look forward to talking to you soon. So again, um, uh, live on Saturday on Saturday morning at 10. And then we'll do this again next week. And then we'll be doing our first round table, which is going to be really, really cool. That'll be yeah, a lot of fun. That's going to be awesome. So anyway, until next time, um, have a wonderful Saturday because that's when you're going to be listening to this. Hopefully you join us for our Facebook Live at 10 o'clock. And until then, we'll see you all again soon. Peace out. Okay, bye guys.